All right, here we go again. So today we are talking about The Brain, The Story of You, written by David Eagleman. Uh, David Eagleman is a neuroscience professor at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and he's written a fabulous book here. Uh, did not disappoint. I love these sciencey books. I like to geek out on the whole biology, pathophysiology type stuff. If you liked the book, Why We Sleep, you'll probably like this one as well. It's not quite as densely packed, but it is similar in that it tells real life stories of individuals, patient scenarios that they've used, case studies on how they've tried to sort of pinpoint certain aspects of brain function as it relates to one aspect of life or another, such as vision, smell, sight. Uh, there's one story in here where they had a, a young girl that was having increasingly worse seizures and that in the end it would result in death. And so they decided to uh, literally remove half her brain. And according to the book, you really wouldn't notice that there was anything different about this young girl. She still participates in sports, uh, has no problem with math and writing and language and et cetera. The half of her brain took over and why can we, you know, why can we do those things? Um, one person lost, had a damaged prefrontal cortex and what the effects of that are, uh, how we learn, how we interpret information. So a lot of really fun things. So uh, let's jump into this. So this first highlight here is under the section, Childhood Pruning, Exposing the Statue in the Marble. What's the secret behind the flexibility of young brains? It's not about growing new cells. In fact, the number of brain cells is the same in children and adults. Instead, the secret lies in how those cells are connected. At birth, a baby's neurons are disparate and unconnected. And in the first two years of life, they begin connecting up extremely rapidly as they take in sensory information. As many as 2 million new connections or synapses are formed every second in an infant's brain. By age two, a child has over 100 trillion synapses, double the number an adult has. It has now reached a peak and has far more connections than it will need. At this point, the blooming of new connections is supplanted by a strategy of neural pruning as you mature, 50% of your synapses will be paired back. Which synapses stay and which go? When a synapse successfully participates in a circuit, it is strengthened. In contrast, synapses weaken if they aren't useful, and eventually they will be eliminated. Just like paths in a forest, you lose the connections that you don't use. In a sense, the process of becoming who you are is defined by carving back the possibilities that were already present. You become who you are, not because of what grows in your brain, but because of what is removed. I found that very, very fascinating. We've all heard that our brain prunes certain synapses, but I didn't know that you essentially have a certain amount of synapses that are, or brain cells, et cetera, when, when you're a child and that the majority of who you are is defining those roadmaps and trimming away the rest. So next, I want to mention this part where he's talking about animals don't have such a plastic brain, a brain that can sort of adapt to new climates or conditions. Uh, he talks about how they, they kind of are born hardwired to do certain things. That's why so many mammals like zebras or gazelles or elk or whatever can basically walk or even run within minutes of being born. They know to run from predators and they have this sort of preset hard wiring in their brain. And that's the behavior that they exhibit throughout their lives. But people are a little different. He says, but compared to the rest of the animal kingdom, human brains are unusually incomplete at birth. The detailed wiring diagram of the human brain is not pre-programmed. Instead, genes give very general directions for the blueprints of neural networks and the world experience fine tunes the rest of the wiring, allowing it to adapt to the local details. The human brain's ability to shape itself to the world into which it's born has allowed our species to take over every ecosystem on the planet and begin our move into the solar system. Wow. That's why you find humans dominating every ecosystem and thriving there while certain animals can only live in that specific ecosystem that they were born to and they struggle to adapt when things change. The next section is sculpting of the adolescent brain. After childhood, just before the onset of puberty, there's a second period of overproduction. 
The prefrontal cortex sprouts new cells and new connections, synapses, thereby creating new pathways for molding. This excess is followed by approximately a decade of pruning. All through our teenage years, weaker connections are trimmed back while stronger connections are reinforced. As a result of this thinning out, the volume of the prefrontal cortex reduces by about 1% per year during the teenage years. The shaping of the circuits during the teen years sets us up for the lessons we learn on our paths to becoming adults. So there's a very interesting story in here. Uh, it's called I Was Blind But Now I See. And he takes this patient named Mike May, who lost his vision at the age of three from a chemical explosion that burned his cornea. I don't know exactly how that happened or why he was there, but that's the case. And so he spent his whole life blind until they performed a specific surgery that repaired his eyesight. But something unexpected happened. Television cameras were on hand to document the moment the bandages came off. Mike describes the experience when the physician peeled back the gauze. There's this whoosh of light and bombarding of images onto my eyes. All of a sudden, you turn on this flood of visual information. It's overwhelming. Mike's new corneas were receiving and focusing light just as they were supposed to, but his brain could not make sense of the information it was receiving. With the news cameras rolling, Mike looked at his children and smiled at them, but inside he was petrified because he couldn't tell what they looked like or which was which. I had no face recognition whatsoever, he recalls. In surgical terms, the transplant had been a total success, but from Mike's point of view, what he was experiencing couldn't be called vision. As he summarized it, my brain was going, oh my gosh. With the help of his doctors and family, he walked out of the exam room and down the hall, casting his gaze toward the carpet the pictures on the wall, the doorways, none of it made sense to him. When he was placed in the car to go home, Mike set his eyes on the car's buildings and people whizzing by, trying unsuccessfully to understand what he was seeing. On the freeway, he recoiled when it looked like they were going to smash into a large rectangle in front of them. It turns out to be a highway sign, which they passed under. He had no sense of what objects were, nor of their depth. In fact, post-surgery, Mike found skiing more difficult than he had as a blind man. Because of his depth perception difficulties, he had a hard time telling the difference between people, trees, shadows, and holes. They all appeared to him simply like dark things against the white snow. The lesson that surfaces from Mike's experience is that the visual system is not like a camera. It's not as though seeing is simply about removing the lens cap. For vision, you need more than functioning eyes. He goes into more detail about how the brain receives information from the world via the eyes and then translates that into basically a language the brain can understand. And we see this in all the other senses as well. I saw a video of David Engelman describing like smell, like what, what helps you understand something that's a foul smell versus a really good smell. And essentially the world doesn't have smell that's an interpretation we make of our brain. So there's all these little microbes and materials floating through the air. And we have receptors in our nose that help us take that particle and say, hmm, that's something that smells, quote unquote, smells good or smells bad. And of course, it's a, it's a mechanism to help us understand, should I eat this or should I avoid this, right? Or is this a toxic material or not? Should I get away? Should I stay? So it's very interesting that the brain actually has to interpret the information that we're using these senses to collect. Okay, so since we have just sort of discussed that, you know, there's all this sensory information we're interpreting, when the senses are cut off, does the show stop then? <laughs> so he, he describes like, we're so tempted to say this part of the brain does this specific thing, this part does this thing, and that every piece of the brain has its own function and, and kind of operates independently. But we know that's not true. There are parts of the brain that are generally in charge of certain functions, long-term memory, motor skills, visual, auditory, etc. But all of those parts of the brain still work with and through other parts of the brain. 
Uh, so it's a very, very complicated thing to figure out. He says, in fact, the brain generates its own reality even before it receives information coming in from the eyes and the other senses. This is known as internal model. The basis of the internal model can be seen in the brain's anatomy. The thalamus sits between the eyes at the front of the head and the visual cortex at the back of the head. Most sensory information connects through here on its way to the appropriate region of the cortex. Visual information goes to the visual cortex, so there are a huge number of connections going from the thalamus into the visual cortex. But here's the surprise. There are 10 times as many going in the opposite direction. Detailed expectations about the world, in other words, what the brain guesses will be out there, are being transmitted by the visual cortex to the thalamus. The thalamus then compares what's coming in from the eyes. If that matches the expectations, when I turn my head, I should see a chair there then very little activity goes back to the visual system. The thalamus simply reports on differences between what the eyes are reporting and what the brain's internal model has predicted. In other words, what gets sent back to the visual cortex is what fell short in the expectations, also known as the error, the part that wasn't predicted away. So at any moment, what we experience as seeing relies less on the light streaming into our eyes and more on what's already inside our heads. I found that incredibly fascinating. So my reality then is sort of based on what I think should be there versus what I notice is difference. So reality is, is partially based on what's already in my head <laughs> for every single one of us. Your reality uh, is different than my reality because my expectations of what might be there versus your expectations and what we notice and then our interpretations of what we see. <laughs> so this next part is under our internal model is low resolution, but upgradable. He says, so why doesn't the brain give us the full picture? Because brains are expensive energy wise. 20% of the calories we consume are used to power the brain. So brains try to operate in the most energy efficient way possible. And that means processing only the minimum amount of information from our senses that we need to navigate the world. They did these studies where they had people look at this picture and they tracked their eye movement. So you, it shows in the page, there's like scribbles all over. And then they tried to quiz them on the image later and say, what did you see? How many people, what was the car? Was it carpet or hardwood or how many pictures on the wall? People were very bad at getting those questions correct, but they had this general idea of what this picture was. And for some reason that was sufficient for them. Like, oh yeah, I remember that picture. And they might remember a few details, but not very much of it, which is kind of funny. We live our lives with this very uh, minimal number of details. And yet we walk around acting and feeling and thinking that we have great detail about certain aspects of our lives or things we've encountered. It's quite fascinating. This section is your reality, my reality. Consider Hannah Bosley. When she looks at letters on, of the alphabet, she has an internal experience of color. For her, it's self-evidently true that J is purple or that T is red. Letters automatically and involuntarily trigger color experiences and her associations never change. Her first name looks to her like a sunset starting with yellow fading into red, then to a color like clouds, and then back into red and to yellow. The name Ian, in contrast, looks like vomit to her, although she's perfectly nice to people with that name. <laughs> Hannah is not being poetic or metaphorical. She has a perceptual experience known as synesthesia. Synesthesia is a condition in which senses, or in some cases concepts, are blended. There are many different kinds of synesthesia. Some taste words, some see sounds as colors, some hear visual motion. About 3% of the population has some form of synesthesia. Hannah is just one of over 6,000 synesthetes I have studied in my lab. In fact, Hannah worked in my lab for two years. I study synesthesia because it's one of the few conditions in which it's clear that someone else's experience of reality is measurably different from mine, and it makes it obvious that how we perceive the world is not one size fits all. Synesthesia is the result of cross talk between sensory areas of the brain. So each area of our brain is sort of linked up with every other part of the brain. And in the case of memory, as we'll see later, 
we share neurons for memories. So there might be a conglomerate of neurons that create one memory and another conglomerate that's another memory. But those two conglomerates might overlap with some of their neurons. And that's the case over and over and over and over. So every memory might be confused with other memories. And in this case, it's a similar situation where sensory parts of the brain are actually cross-functioning. So something that's just a sound to me might be a sound and a taste to somebody else. Okay, you've you've heard people say that when something crazy happens, it's like the wor world goes in slow motion and they can think of several minutes or, or hours of time in just a split second and it feels slow to them. He says, so why do Jeb and I both recall our accidents as happening in slow motion? The answer appears to lie in the way our memories are stored. In threatening situations, an area of the brain called the amygdala kicks into high gear, commandeering the resources of the rest of the brain and forcing everything to attend to the situation at hand. When the amygdala is in play, memories are laid down with far more detail and richness than under normal circumstances. A secondary memory system has been activated. After all, that's what memory is for keeping track of important events so that if you're ever in the situation, your brain has more information to try to survive. In other words, when things are life-threatening scary, it's a good time to take notes. The interesting side effect is this. Your brain is not accustomed to that kind of density of memory. The hood was crumpled. The rearview mirror was falling off. The other driver looked like my neighbor, Bob. So when the events are replayed in your memory, your interpretation is that the event must have taken a longer time. I'd never heard a good explanation of that. I thought it was just that synapses were firing better or something, but the fact that we recruit the entire brain to pay attention and take notes of these very critical details, at least as interpreted by the brain in the moment, it feels slow motion because we've never thought that fast and clearly before about a specific situation. <laughs> For every situation with multiple witnesses, different brains are having different private subjective experiences. With 7 billion human brains wandering the planet and trillions of animal brains, there's no single version of reality. Each brain carries its own truth. So what is reality? It's like a television show that only you can see and you can't turn it off. The good news is that it happens to be broadcasting the most interesting show you could ask for. Edited, personalized, and presented just for you. So I want to paraphrase this section for you a bit. He goes to work with this young kid. His name's Austin, and he has the world record for the cup stacking thing, where they take a stack of cups, unstack them into a pyramid, and then restack them into one column. And Austin can do it in like five seconds. And he's got the world record for young kids that age. Dr. Eagleman goes and does it. And his, after several attempts, his fastest was like 40 seconds. So then they measured their brain activity to see what, what parts of the brain were working and how much energy and things. And, you know, you might assume that Austin's brain is working super hard and fast because he does it in five seconds. But actually, Austin's brain almost acts like nothing's happening because he's ingrained this into subconscious memory. It's sort of that whole practicing something over and over creates muscle memory. It's not muscle memory, it's brain memory. It's subconscious memory. Uh, whereas Dr. Eagleman hasn't created a subconscious memory of this and he's got active focused memory towards this. So even though he's much, much slower than Austin, his brain is in like overdrive and Austin's is as if nothing special is happening at all. So to explain a, a little bit more about the biology of this, he's got these little like one pagers uh, in gray that describe certain scientific facts and things. So in this one, synapses and learning. The connections between neurons are called synapses. These connections are where chemicals called neurotransmitters carry signals between neurons, but synaptic connections are not all the same strength. Depending on their history of activity, they can become stronger or weaker. As synapses change their potency, information flows through the network differently. If a connection gets weak enough, it withers and goes away. If it gets strengthened, it can sprout new connections. Some of this reconfiguring is guided by reward systems, which globally broadcast a neurotransmitter called dopamine when something has gone well. 
Austin's brain networks have been reshaped very slowly, very subtly by the success or failure of each attempted move over hundreds of hours of practice. So that's essentially how we strengthen these pathways through the trees, as he described earlier, versus trim them back, use it or lose it. That's the truth in the brain. And as we've talked about many times in, in different scenarios, like the skeletal system can give feedback to the brain, which recruits resources to then build up your skeletal and muscular system as a result of weight training. Similar things with other kinds of exercise or brain functions. So if you're going to work on Sudoku or learn a new language, those require high energy from your brain. But the more you do it, the less energy it requires, the stronger those synapses become and the more automatically you can do it with ease. A bit more on the deep caverns of the unconscious. So he says, take another experiment designed by psychologist Eckhard Hess in 1965. Men were asked to look at photographs of women's faces and make judgments about them. How attractive were they on a scale from one to 10? Were they happy or sad, mean or kind, friendly or unfriendly? Unbeknownst to the participants, the photographs had been manipulated. In half of the photographs, the women's pupils had been artificially dilated. The men found the women with dilated eyes to be more attractive. None of the men explicitly noted anything about women's pupil size, and presumably none of the men knew that dilated eyes are a biological sign of a female arousal, but their brains knew it, and the men were unconsciously steered toward the women with the dilated eyes, finding them to be more beautiful, happier, kinder, and more friendly. <laughs> the subconscious mind is doing all kinds of things that we totally are unaware of and yet dictates major choices in our lives. In another experiment, evolutionary psychologist Jeffrey Miller quantified how sexually attractive a woman is to a man by recording the earnings of lap dancers in a strip club. And he tracked how this changed over their monthly menstrual cycle. As it turned out, men gave twice as much in tips when the dancer was ovulating as when she was menstruating. But the strange part is that the men weren't consciously aware of the biological changes that attend the monthly cycle. That when she is ovulating, a surge of the hormone estrogen changes her appearance subtly, making her features more symmetrical, her skin softer, and her waist narrower. But they detected these fertility cues nonetheless under the radar of awareness. Pretty freaky, huh? We have this ability to tune into slight little subtle differences that change the way we operate. And most of it is completely under our radar of consciousness. But consciousness isn't just about reacting to surprises. It also plays a vital role in settling conflict within the brain. Billions of neurons participate in tasks ranging from breathing to moving through your bedroom to getting food into your mouth to mastering a sport. These tasks are each underpinned by vast networks in the machinery of the brain. But what happens if there's a conflict? Say you find yourself reaching for an ice cream sundae, but you know that you'll regret having eaten it. In a situation like that, a decision has to be made, a decision that works out what's best for the organism, you, and your long-term goals. Consciousness is the system that has this unique vantage point, one that no other subsystem of the brain has. And for this reason, it can play the role of arbiter of the billions of interactions, elements, subsystems, and burnt-in processes. It can make plans and set goals for the system as a whole. One more example of how your subconscious is controlling your life and you don't even know it. Because the conscious mind has low bandwidth, you don't typically have full access to the bodily signals that tip your decisions. Most of the action in your body lives far below your awareness. Nonetheless, the signals have far-reaching consequences on the type of person you believe you are. As one example, neuroscientist Reed Montague has found a link between a person's politics and the character of their emotional responses. He puts participants in a brain scanner and measures their response to a series of images chosen to evoke a disgust response, from images of feces to dead bodies to insect-covered food. When they emerge from the scanner, they are asked if they would like to take part in another experiment. If they say yes, they take 10 minutes to answer a political ideology survey. They're asked questions about their feelings on gun control, abortion, premarital sex, and so on. Montague finds that the more disgusted a participant is by the images, the more politically conservative they are likely to be. The less disgusted, the more liberal. 
The correlation is so strong that a person's neural response to a single disgusting image predicts their score on the political ideology test with 95% accuracy. Political persuasion emerges as the intersection of the mental and the corporal. So some of the studies that they're working on to try and help us override brain systems or um, apply this technology and understanding of the brain's functions to help people with like addiction is one of the examples he uses in here. So he talks about this 50 year old woman who has a generally good personality, very bubbly, lively, et cetera. But she is straight up addicted to cocaine and she uses cocaine and she describes the experiences. Like if I come across cocaine, it's as if I don't have a choice. I have to take the cocaine. And so he's working on this, system where they put her in the brain scanner. Uh, so they hook her brain up to these electrodes and try and understand which parts of the brain are active. And then they'll have her think about cocaine or show her a picture of cocaine or something and tell her crave cocaine. And then she can start doing that. They can see the visual image of what her brain is doing. And then they'll say, overcome that craving. And she'll start trying to decrease those feelings of like, I need it, I need it, and trying to overcome it. And she can visualize when she's actually being successful versus not. And the idea is to train her to have this skill set that formerly was not visual, but now she can understand what methods she's using that are actually effective in helping her change her state of emotions and uh, urges. And so that hopefully one day when she's out in normal life and comes across an opportunity to use cocaine, she can activate those practiced strategies to overcome that urge. This is another one that I was very surprised and and pretty excited about. Hopefully the future is bright here, but they talk about this gentleman who um, essentially was quite antisocial. He didn't like that people picked on him. He had uh, more of a he he found more joy in life working with technology and machinery and things like that. And he ended up as a roadie for like ACDC and people would ask him about the band members. And what he would say is, man, he played that show with seven bass amps all connected and da, da, da. he didn't care or even know much about the band members personalities and how they were. He was really into the technology that he was setting up on the stage until something happened for him. So, in the middle of the story here, he says, then something happened that transformed John's life. In 2008, he was invited to take part in an experiment at Harvard Medical School. A team led by Dr. Alvaro Pascal Leon was using transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, to assess how activity in one area of the brain affected activity in another area. TMS emits a strong magnetic pulse next to the head, which is turned which in turn induces a small electric current in the brain, temporarily disrupting local brain activity. The experiment was meant to help the researchers gain greater knowledge about the autistic brain. The team used TMS to target different regions of John's brain involved in high order cognitive function. At first, John reported this stimulation had no effect, but in one session, the researchers applied TMS to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex an evolutionary recent part of the brain involved in flexible thinking and abstraction. John reported that he somehow became different. John called up Dr. Pascal Leone to let him know that the effects of the stimulation seemed to have unlocked something in him. The effects lasted beyond the experiment itself. John reported for John, it had opened up a whole new window on the social world. He simply didn't realize that there were messages emanating from the facial expressions of other people. But after the experiment, he was now aware of those messages. To John, his experience of the world was now changed. So I found that just incredibly wild that maybe this part of the brain had, you know, crossed sing- signals, blocked signals, something was going on. But for some reason, this magnetic stimulation of that particular area of the brain unlocked a whole new sensory perception for John that previously didn't exist. All right, the last thing that I'll share with you is he's, he's, Towards the latter part of the book, he's talking a lot about futuristic things, things that we're trying to bring into play. Maybe we can download people's memory. Maybe we can give people a second chance at life by regenerating certain things, AI, all kinds of stuff. 
But I found this interesting that he calls the brain liveware because we're constantly trying to emulate the function of human experience in a computer using hardware or software. But the problem is the human brain is liveware and the brain itself can re redirect or restructure itself. So much like electricity running through wires, our brain is using all kinds of electrical signals to and from different spots in the brain or even different parts of the body. But because it's like a giant conglomerate of many, many, many wires and they all are intertwined. And so how something gets from point A through that conglomerate to point B in an efficient, effective way is as of now impossible for us to duplicate or even simulate uh, because a brain can restructure itself according to the needs of the instance According to our practice, we can change a behavior over time and change something that was once very uh, habitual and automatic into a different pattern and destroy the old one, uh, things like that. So the liveware that we have in our brain is at this point impossible to duplicate. The, the brain is a very fascinating organ and interesting part of life. He talks a lot about consciousness in here and what exactly makes consciousness. So a lot of interesting things that I kind of left uh, undiscussed here. I highly encourage this one. It's a fun book to read. Very stimulating, very interesting, helps you understand who you are, uh, which of course is the story of you. So I uh, appreciate you guys being here. If you want to purchase this book, I'll put the link in the notes below and uh, please share, comment, review, and rate this podcast so that we can reach a broader audience. I appreciate you being here. We'll talk to you on the next one.